It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. We are excited to have in studio today Ryan Zolan with the Zolan Group and 34 Holdings, LLC, as well as his broker, Steve Trang, owner of Stunning Homes Realty and Max Cash Offers. So Ryan and Steve, welcome to the studio. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome thank you for guys. having us. Yeah. So you guys can flip a coin as to who goes first, but we always like to have our uh, guests to set, or tell us a little bit about themselves from their you know, family background, how they got into what it is that they're doing. Obviously, for you guys, that's real estate. So who wants to go first and tell us a little bit about themselves? Sure. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go first. So I got into real estate at 18 years old. I've got a traditional real estate team helping families buy and sell houses throughout the valley. And then I also have that investment company, 34 Holdings, where we do flips, we do wholesaling. Uh, we've got a couple rental properties and pretty much anything and everything real estate. We've done a lot of commercial deals. Um, you name it, we do it real estate related. So quick little elevator pitch, but um, been doing this for four years now. And um, yeah, just can't say enough good things about real estate. I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. What about uh, from a family standpoint? Brothers, sisters? Yes, I've got a brother, Josh. He runs my dad's company. They have a restaurant repair and HVAC company in the Valley as well. Um, they're across, I think, four or five states. But I've got them. And then my mom's out here as well. And then most of my family is uh, remaining in Chicago. So Cool. So you you grew up in Chicago mostly? I did. I uh, I moved out here when I was probably about six, seven. And oh. so I've really grown up out here, but I still consider myself a Chicago boy. <laughs> All right. Go Cubs, right? Right. All right, Steve, how about you? Uh, I got in real estate back in 2007. You know, I think this is around the time a lot of people were reading uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad and learning that there's other ways to make money besides a W-2. And so we wanted to buy some rental properties. And uh, in, in the process of trying to buy rental properties, I learned, uh, I met a real estate broker. And so uh, I was just sitting across the table from him and just thinking like, what you do is fascinating. Like, what is exactly do you do? It's like, I just talk to people all day. I yeah. said, okay, <laughs> what kind of money do you make doing that? He's like, well, you know, make six figures a year. I said, okay, it's more than I'm making. Uh, <laughs> let me check this out. And so I asked him, what would it take to learn from someone like him? And he said, go get your real estate license. I'll teach you everything I know. So I got my license in two and a half weeks. And after I got licensed, submitted my two weeks notice and just went all in on real estate. Probably wasn't the smartest decision. Looks like 2007 was not the best time to get into real estate. <laughs> yeah. In hindsight. If hindsight were 2020, yes. <laughs> but I got to cut my teeth in a bad time. And I think that really helped me a lot when things turned around. So uh, that's what got me into it. And um, it's, it's been very good to me since 2007. Well, since like 2013. The first six years were not the, the best. <laughs> but getting into it has, has, has been good. Yeah, very cool. So what about uh, where were you born and raised? Do you have a family yourself? Yeah, so uh, I was born in Italy. I was born in a refugee camp. Quick background is, you know, my, my grandparents, they're all in, from China. And this little thing came around, you know, everyone being created equal, or, you know, communism, uh, <laughs> took everything from my grandparents. So they fled to Vietnam and uh, they set up over there. My parents were born and communism took over again, and took everything from them. So we came here. I was born in, in a refugee camp because we were picked up in an Italian Navy ship. Came here. Everything I know is, is the United States. You know, I have a picture of when I, when we came into Sky Harbor when I was seven months old. But Oh, wow. Uh, so everything I know is here, but, you know, that's something that's always, you know, in the back of your mind. Family, uh, I'm the oldest of six boys. And, uh, you know, my other five younger brothers are all born in Phoenix. And we're all still here in the Phoenix metro area. And then I uh, got uh, an awesome wife who really... Uh, allows me in some more or less way to do the things I want to do. Uh, I probably drive her crazy all the time. We all do. But, you know, I couldn't ask for a, a better wife. And then I got three beautiful daughters who also challenge me in their own ways. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's just payback for, for me. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, being being raised one of six boys and then having three daughters, that's yeah. got to be a, 
a learning curve in and of itself. Well, emotions happen with girls. <laughs> you're, you're preaching to the choir. I've got a 17-year-old daughter. Trust me, I know. Yeah, yeah. so crying was not allowed when I was growing up. So, and, and, and any of my brothers, but you got, you got to be a little different, especially this age, this generation. Yeah. Well, I, I do need to ask you a little bit more about uh, the refugee side of things. Yeah. Just uh, my wife would be very unhappy with me if I didn't. Uh, my wife volunteers for a couple of different refugee organizations, and it's very important to her. Matter of fact, there's a mask sitting right here on the desk that I wore in today that, that my wife and daughter made, and they donate the proceeds to refugee organizations here in, in Phoenix because it's just something that's that's near and dear to her heart and, and obviously by extension for me as well. So you, you know, obviously only lived in that refugee camp for about seven months. Like you said, you were born mm -hmm. there and then seven months later you were here. But how long were your parents in, in that refugee camp? I don't think that much longer, you know, I think less than a year altogether. No. Um, you know, I, I, I know that uh, my mom was pregnant with me when they were, when they um, were in the ocean. Oh, okay. Um, so I know that much. So re relatively short comparatively, yeah. there are a lot of people who spend a long, long time in refugee yeah. camps today. Yeah. So. so there's some, you know, some fascinating stories that, um, you know, things that you have to do to take care of yourself Yeah. Uh, there. So uh, it's funny, like my dad, everyone that knows my dad thinks he's a sweetheart and I'm not saying he's not a good guy, right? <laughs> but he was the, one of the guys that, you know, kept order. So if someone needed to be put in their place, that was my dad. That was your dad. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's fascinating. And it's really cool to see somebody living the American dream. Not that you're not living the American <laughs> dream, Ryan, but, you know, somebody who actually was born in a refugee camp and, and yeah. you know, today you're, you're living and breathing what the American dream is all about. So that's really cool. 100%. Yeah. Cool. Well, so this question can be for both of you, but let's start with Ryan. So Ryan, tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got started in real estate and why, you know, specifically as an 18 year old, did you decide to get in real estate? I was 23 when I got into the business that I'm in today, and it's been a little over 20 years now, and it was hard enough at 23. So tell me, you know, how'd you get started at 18 and, and what kind of struggles have you dealt with uh, in the first four years? Yeah. So 18 years old, I mean, you really don't know anything about life, that's for sure. Come out of high school <laughs> and you learn everything that you need to know about the real world in high school, right? Yeah, so, right. <laughs> um, no, I, I was fortunate enough that I was in a business marketing club called DECA. Um, I had become the vice president my senior year, so I was in charge of a lot of students. Um, I ran all the events. I always had that business kind of atmosphere around me and just, I don't know, that was like what I wanted to do. I competed at international competitions for, business, for the business club. I went to one rich dad, poor dad convention with my brother and one of his friends. And I slept, I think, through the entire thing. Um, so it was just kind of like a real estate was in the back of my mind type thing. I graduated in 2016 and my dad sat down with me and was like, okay, I'll pay for college, but it's only gonna be if you're a doctor, a lawyer, attorney, engineer, whatever it is that you need, like an actual degree that's gonna make you some money. And I hated school. So as I was going through all of that, I kind of like crossed off all of those because I'm like, that's not just four years. You're talking six, eight, 10 plus years of college. So I crossed all those off. Um, it was July 5th of 2016. He was just like, why don't you try real estate school? And I figured I had nothing to lose. Started it, got out in August and I just didn't look back. So it wasn't really like a chosen career, I guess. It just kind of fell into it. But it was more of just like, I think I had that experience of going to that one convention. And it was something that I knew you didn't need to go to college for. And I knew a lot of guys that were making a lot of money doing it. So kind of jumped two feet in and I haven't looked back since. So yeah, no, that's a, that's a cool story. It's funny. It's pretty similar to my own personal background in that, you know, I was sure law school was where I was headed. I wanted to be an attorney. <laughs> and, and for me, it wasn't, you know, there was only one area of the law as far as I was concerned. I was going to be either a criminal defense attorney or I was going to be a criminal prosecutor. And I saw the opportunity to, you know, be that person who's standing up and in a courtroom and doing, you know, mm -hmm. that every single day. And then I took an entrepreneurship and, and uh, uh, stock market class in ninth grade, and it completely changed the trajectory of the direction that I was, that I was headed. So very, very cool story. Now, you've already kind of let us know a little bit on, on your side, Steve, how you got into real estate, but was there something specific that besides rich dad, poor dad, that got you into real estate itself? No, it was pretty much greed. Um, you know, <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to make as much money as I could. And okay. that was, that was really it. I, I was not, I'm not the ideal employee, you know, like I, I did well, uh, but I, I worked at Intel 
And I was working like 25 hours a week. I mean, I was coming in at 930, leaving before five. And so my results were always good. You know, every review I had was exceeds expectations, but I was not necessarily the hardest worker. The one time they asked me to stay late, I was like, I can't, I already have commitment. And I went home and watched TV. Like (laughs) I was not the hardest working employee. So it was just, for me, I was always trying to figure out how can I maximize my hourly rate? And you can't as a W-2. And so I was always looking for the next thing. And I always knew I was going to start a business at some point. And my plan when I started Intel, you know, they got the golden handcuffs of seven years uh, before all everything vests. So I said, you know what? I'm going to work for seven years. I'm going to let everything vest and I'm going to quit and be an independent contractor because you make 50 to 80% more as an independent contractor doing the same exact work. I'll just have to find a wife that's got benefits. You know, that was the plan. Yeah. Uh, but then when I, so I'm at the real estate broker, it's like, okay, well, scratch that plan. Let's just do this. Let's go off on our own. And I want to give, you know, Ryan some credit. He didn't really uh, touch on this. You know, he started as 18, but he surrounded himself with the right people. You know, uh, he worked with a good friend of mine and then he went to go work with another good friend of mine, Templeton. Uh, and he's invested himself in another friend's education course. So, you know, like it's starting at 18, you don't know all, you don't have all the answers. Even though I think at 15, I knew I had, I, I thought I knew everything. I realized I didn't. <laughs> yeah, all 15 year olds think they know everything <laughs> at 15. Yeah, But he's consistently sought the knowledge, the wisdom, surround himself with the right people. So I think that's, uh, if there's anyone that's younger, or may, maybe it's not even too late, you know, if you're older, but the best way to improve your, upon yourself, improve your business is surround yourself with people that have the success that you desire. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. That's fantastic advice and great to see. And, and I'm sure that's how Ryan's been so successful in the first four years. Yeah. 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 Ryan, I got a quick uh, follow-up sure. uh, comment question for you. So I've, love entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs. There's just something really unique and special about young entrepreneurs in their late teens and early 20s. And I just find them fascinating. And I have to ask because I know what I was doing in my late teens and early 20s. And even though my grandfather was an entrepreneur, my father's an entrepreneur, my sister's an entrepreneur, I was have been very entrepreneurial minded my entire life. I wasn't even thinking about anything entrepreneurial when I was in my late teens and early twenties. So how did you, how do you, how did you overcome that obstacle of being 18 and wanting to hang out with friends and party and experience life to getting into real estate? Can you just talk to us about that for a couple minutes? Yeah. So, um, I think that I definitely have some remorse to that. I feel like that's my my biggest regret about the college experience isn't really so much of college itself. It's like, I feel like there's the college, there's the dorm experience you meet. So from what my parents have even said, you meet some of your closest friends for your entire life from college. One conversation my dad had with me right when I got into real estate was, you're going to succeed at this pretty well. And I think he kind of knew that just from my experience through DECA. Um, but he had mentioned that I needed to just kind of stay humble and understand that you're going to start to see that you outgrow a lot of people your age pretty quickly. And that was something I didn't really take serious till about like a year or two ago where I was like, okay, I'm starting to see it 21, 22 year olds. And they're starting to still continue to party, stay out till 2am, 3am. It's Friday night. They're like, Hey, let's go out and let's go, let's go to the bars. Let's go do this. And I'm like, man, it's nine o'clock. Like, <laughs> guys, it's, it's getting close to bedtime. I don't know. I've got an open house tomorrow yeah, morning. Right? What are you talking about? Right? I was like, I got showings in the morning. <laughs> no, I, uh, I don't know. I feel like for me, it was just kind of one of those things I had to weigh out the pros and cons. And um, there's a bunch of influencers on social media that I follow that would say the same thing of don't get into drugs, parties, alcohol, all that's just a distraction. Like, don't get me wrong. In real estate, I feel like your third language has to be going to happy hours and know how to drink. But at the same time, I also understood that a lot of that could just be a distraction. So I still made some of my closest friends in real estate. I was able to uh, meet up with friends that I knew through the club, through high school, that were a couple of years older that as I started to succeed, what I started to see was a lot of them was, oh, hey, what are you doing? Like, I see that you're starting to really kill it in real estate and I'm 24 out of college and I have a piece of paper that's not going to get me anywhere. What do I do? So they all would hit me up. They'd want to go grab lunch. They'd want to pick my brain. And one thing that I just kind of had to wrap my head around was don't say no. Anytime anybody wants to go out, which is kind of ironic. We were just talking about this today, but going to lunch with people is just say yes, just always go for it. And so I went and I would meet up with a bunch of guys that were typically just 25 to 30. 
And that's kind of been like my audience that I've brought in. So um, I don't know. I think it was just a mindset switch. I had to realize that what's the gain from not going to that kind of stuff. But at the same time, like, don't get me wrong. I still, I partied a little bit. Just wasn't nearly as much as I'd say the typical 18 to 24. But no, I wouldn't change any of it. I think that people that are that age, they need to figure out what their why is. Once you figure out what your why is, reverse engineer it, figure out what the, the steps are, what's going to get in the way of you actually getting to that why. And then it's all about how long it, you want it to take to get there. If you want to get to that why by 30, 40, 50, 60, you could probably mess around for a few years. If you want to be financially free by 30, probably not. So, Love it. Love it. Now, Steve, have you been around since the inception of his real estate career? Did no. you guys meet a little bit later? Uh, we connected about two years ago. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So you, you mentioned that you um, you go to lunch a lot and your friends are kind of picking your brain and they're out of school and trying to figure out what they want to do. And uh, clearly at this point in your life, you have, you figured out what you want to do. So talk to us a little bit about how you've, you know, so rapidly grown your, your little uh, real estate uh, business. Yeah. I mean, I can give the quick rundown of how the journey has gone. Steve kind of hit on it a little bit, but I started off with a mutual friend of his, um, I had no idea who Steve was at the time. Um, I started off, I interviewed a bunch of brokerages when I was in real estate school, which is what they tell you to do. Um, I narrowed it down to two. One was like a super modern, flashy penthouse brokerage. And one was a very common, just Keller Williams. And the team that had interviewed me at Keller Williams, they offered me a salary. And again, at 18 years old, you're looking at it like, okay, well, I've got to be my own boss. I've got to find this own business. So when somebody offers you a salary, you're like, okay, this is cool. Granted, it was $24,000 and it was also not taxed. So that really goes away pretty quickly. Um, it was a very good learning experience for me because while I was on that team, they had me be an ISA, which is an inside sales agent. And they stuck me back in a corner of a hallway and they put a partition up and they had me there from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. making phone calls all day, every day. So I was doing the dirty work, doing all the, the legwork to find the deals for them. But I think one of the biggest hurdles people have to get over pretty quickly in real estate is getting on the phones. A lot of people don't want to do that. They're too scared. Um, even what I found is young people to get in, they're like, I got to call somebody. I can't text them. I'm like, oh, well, you can, but just pick up the phone and call people. So <laughs> um, I was doing that for, like I said, 11, 12 hours a day. Um, I got four deals in my first four months. And after I got those four deals, they didn't pay me, which was kind of my first red flag, but they didn't pay me till it was like two months later. It was with one of my paychecks and they gave me a check for 900 bucks. And I was like, okay, I know I'm not good at math here, but something doesn't add up if I got $900 for four deals and my biggest film was 450,000. So that, I knew the commission on that one. Once I did the math, it was like 13 grand alone on that. So when I got 900 bucks for the four deals all combined, I kind of took a step back and I was like, this is not something, something's off here. I aligned myself with a guy who was like willing to take me under his wing and basically mentor me for the next year or so. And he was a guy that my dad had known. He takes care of his restaurant equipment. It's uh, the Hungry Howie's right over by ASU. So he was in real estate. He had his own business. He had a just very successful business guy. And ironically enough, he was over at that brokerage that I wanted to be at with the penthouse. So it was just kind of like a match made in heaven. He took me under his wing as like a mentor mentee relationship. And in that first year of just kind of learning the ropes, we were the number three team at the brokerage. So where I went from what was like $30,000 in the first year, I made like 60, 70,000 the next year. And that was with just what I considered learning the ropes. So I already had a bad taste in my mouth from the whole teams and like that whole split and partnerships. So of course, what did I do at 19 years old? I was like, I need to create a team. I need to have a partner. Like this is exact opposite of what I wanted. So I just kind of trusted my intuition and went for it sat down with him. We became 50-50 business partners and we grew the team to have 16 agents under us. So we went from being the number three team all the way up to being the number one team that next year at the brokerage. Uh, we did a lot of commercial deals. We sold like a $7.9 million car wash. We sold horse ranches. We did a lot of commercial leases for big investor companies. Did that for a couple of years or it was a year and a half. And I went to the brokers and I was like, hey, I want to like create like a business relationship with you guys. I want to establish myself as like, this is the place for me. And they basically talked down to me and treated me like a kid. And so that was like, again, trust intuition. I was like, I'm out. So I left that place and I went and I partnered with, like Steve said, um, Templeton, one of his buddies that's over at his brokerage now. And it was that big, fancy, flashy, shiny object syndrome, um, MLM brokerage. So we were there for like three months, but 
I basically fired everybody, had the 16 agents, got rid of all of them, kept two of them. And out of those two, I only kept one while we went over to the MLM. But we were there for three months. They lost a bunch of our checks. It was just a disaster. And I felt kind of lost. So I took a step back and I went to the guy Templeton. And I was like, dude, this sucks. Like this brokerage is not what it was made out to be. I went from making six figures a year to now I'm only going to make 50 to 60. What's, what's going on? And he was like, yeah, you know what? I actually think that this is not for me either. And he's like, why don't we go back to the place I was at? And he's like, I've got this guy. He's an incredible broker. His name's Steve. And I just haven't looked back since then. I met up with Steve and he taught me everything, really just opened up the door for a lot of relationships for networking with bigger name investors, wholesalers, fix and flippers. And it was actually kind of cool because as I was coming, it was like right around the time Steve launched his podcast. So I got to see that from really when Steve was already in my eyes, a big shot to being like now what I consider a celebrity in real estate. <laughs> so um, we got to do that. And then I've been with Steve for two years and my business has really tripled since then. So let the record show they're looking at each other as star-crossed lovers across the table now. So <laughs> That's correct. I can confirm. <laughs> I tell you. Well, so obviously you've given us a little bit of a history as yep. to you know how you've gotten to where you are, but you know, you've hinted at some struggles. And so I want to take a quick break to hear from one of our sponsors. But when we come back, let's talk a little bit about some of the struggles that you've had to overcome outside of some of the things that you mentioned with brokers and so forth. At Paylocity, we deliver more than our awesome product suite with crazy good reviews. We prioritize your success by covering you with a deep support system to back up our easy to use, innovative HR solutions. Everything we do is designed to support you in reaching your goals. Together, we tackle your day-to-day -day work so that you can spend more time building the culture you and your employees crave. For professionals who crave true partnership, Paylocity is the HR and payroll company that frees you from the tasks of today. So together, we can spend more time focused on the promise of tomorrow. Let's go forward together. All right. Welcome back, tycoons. We're here with a couple of real estate tycoons, Steve Trang and Ryan Zolan, telling us a little bit about their background and how they've gotten to where they are today. And so I want to touch a little bit more on the struggles because we all know that real estate is not just, you know, pick up the phone and all of a sudden you're making six figures, you know, year two, so to speak, um, unless you really grind through it. So tell us a little bit about the struggles that you guys have, have overcome over the years and, and how did you overcome those? Oh, so uh, I could say the struggles I had was, you know, uh, I, I have no shortage of confidence. So when I started in 2007, you know, you can see like this bubble is about to burst, but I was thinking, you know, what, I'll, I'll figure it out. Uh, and that's always been my, you know, MO is like, I'll always figure it out. Uh, but that was a little bit bigger uh, than, uh, than I was capable of handling on my own. And so when you get started, uh, I didn't have a lot of guidance, you know, uh, the, my mentor at that time was great at sales, uh, but he's never gone through a downturn. And so I'm trying to figure this out with some help on his part. And you don't know, you know, you get sold the vision of, of, of you know, all this time and money as a realtor, but in reality, it sucks. Like being a realtor actually sucks most of the time. Yeah. And so, uh, I, I didn't know what to do. I signed up for a bunch of different advertising platforms. I, Signed a long-term commitment with Realtor.com. I signed up to do uh, CoStar, which is the commercial MLS. Signed a long-term contract at two thousand a month, which was a complete waste. So I just did. A, I made a lot of mistakes getting started, and uh, this attitude of "I'll figure it out" is usually a good thing. But when you're signing up for all these credit, uh, these these long-term commitments, it can come back to bite you. So uh, at my worst, uh, I had about forty-five thousand in credit card debt. And this is around the same time where I was telling the bank, you know, everyone's kind of going through foreclosure. I told the second mortgage, like, hey, I'm not paying this anymore. You know, I'd love to settle this with you guys. And they said, no, you don't settle with it. We, we won't settle it. And I said, okay, fine. Well, I'm not paying it. And so, I, I, and to do a loan mod, you have to have actually your first mortgage face foreclosure too. So I had to go down that road. Yeah. And so I went down this period of time where I wasn't making any money. In fact, my, my 1040 in 2009 was negative 50,000. You know, my expenses were higher than my revenue by 50,000. Uh, so this was a really tough time. And Chase Bank, you know, I, I go to the uh, grocery store and I'm, you know, I'm using my credit card. It's like declined. It's like, why is it declined? And, you know, I called them and I said, what's going on here? And it's like, oh, we don't believe that you can pay your credit card. I was like, well, I've never had, I've never missed the payment. I have every intent of paying this off, right? I'm not that kind of person. But because of my history with my mortgage, 
You know, they're like, well, we don't believe you can pay it off. Like, and I said, well, you know what? You're right. I'll never be able to pay that off. So I settled that one for like 10000 out of 45. You know, that was their loss. I had every intent of paying it. Uh, but in going through all these struggles, it's not the financial part because the financial one, you can always recover. Or in America, you know, our president has filed how many bankruptcies? Like you can get, you can recover <laughs> from financial challenges. Yeah. But family challenges, personal challenges, right? Like having a wife that you promise to take care of, seeing you struggle, not feeling safe. Like those were really, really tough times. You know, the D word was thrown out a couple of times. Yeah. So those are the biggest struggles. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, uh, young entrepreneurs. I think it's great for young entrepreneurs because you don't have any responsibilities, right? Like if you fail, you fail, like whatever. Uh, but when you're married and I didn't have kids yet, but man, like it'd be even harder when your kids can. I, uh, I grew up here, you know, being a huge sports fan, Cardinals fan. And I remember when they made their Super Bowl run, you know, like the Cardinals making a Super Bowl run. Like this is, <laughs> you know, this is hell freezing over. And I didn't have $300 to pay f to see them, you know, host the Western Conference, not Western Conference, but the NFC Championship game. Yeah. I couldn't go. Like we had home field advantage. And so like those are the kinds of things that I still uh, remember. Those are the challenges. Uh, but, you know, the, as far as how do we overcome them, I don't know. You just do. Like you don't have a choice. You don't have an option. Yeah. You know, you just have... Someone asked yesterday, like, what's the difference between those that succeed in the space and those that don't? And the ones that succeed are the ones that say, I must succeed. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the way I've explained it to some other people is like, you know, uh, most people want to succeed. Like, I want a six pack. Like, I really want one. Like, they look really cool, but I'm not going <laughs> to the, make the sacrifices necessary to get one. Yeah. So I hear you. Yeah, no, and I, I, I agree. I mean, I think obviously the personal side of things can be way more difficult to deal with than the financial side. Like yeah. you said, we're in America. There is there is the ability to figure it out financially if you're willing to put in the work, right? Yeah. And that is really the difference between success and failure in a lot of instances is are you willing to put in the work, right? And, and you're 100% right. I mean, I, I think Ryan has a girlfriend, but you're not married yet, right? Nope. Okay. And so- Just a girlfriend. <laughs> and, and honestly, <laughs> if you failed miserably tomorrow- you're 22. So what? For you sure. go get a different yeah. job and you could you could even choose to go to college now if you chose to and and you'd fit right in, right? I mean, you're the same age as a lot of the people who are still in college. So it wouldn't be as big of a deal for you as it is for you now, of course, having three children. But, yeah. you know, we don't expect you to fail, Ryan. We, we've <laughs> seen what you've accomplished in the last four years. We, we, we think you'll be just fine. So, but for you, I mean, what's, what's the biggest struggles that you've overcome yeah. and how have you done it? So um, I would say that the two biggest for sure is going to be number one mindset. Um, like Steve kind of hit on a little bit. I think at 18 years old, one of my biggest struggles is that I had never bought anything in my life. So you don't get a loan for anything. So when somebody comes to you and says, hey, I want to make the biggest purchase or sale my entire life at 18 years old, how do you have the confidence to be like, I can do it? Yep. And it also kind of goes hand in hand with the second one, which is just age. I think that also, like I just said, it's the biggest purchase people make. 40, 50-year-olds, what's going to make them come over and trust an 18-year-old to help them with buying a house? So that's why I was, I guess, fortunate enough to align myself with the right people is that I needed that confidence for myself. Um, when I had that business partner, I used to tell everybody I was a social media guy. I didn't care if I was on the contracts or not because it didn't, I, I don't care about the credit. I cared about the payday at the end. So, um, and on top of that, when you're that age, I feel like you have to kind of play your benefits. And most people that are 30s, 40s, 50s, they look at somebody 18, 19, they're like, he knows what he's doing with social media. Regardless if I'd ever <laughs> posted or not, they were like, I get it. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. So I just kind of played into that a little bit. I'd come around with a camera, I'd dress up in slacks and a polo and my partner would show up and just polo and shorts and he wouldn't care. That's how I overcame that. But I think mindset at 18, 19. I do have to say, though, at the same time, I like to, because I, I do have a lot of younger guys on my team. What I like to tell them is what you just said. If you fail, what's the worst case scenario? You're 21, you're 22. And that's even if they're not 18 or 19. Like, yeah. you're so young that go get a W 2 job and you're fine. Like, figure it out. Uh, if you need to go back to college, you're still young enough. If you've got all these things, you don't have, uh, um, I think I've even talked to Steve about this before. One of my struggles with hiring people that are in their 30s and 40s and 50s is that when you bring them on, that's a lot of pressure on me. There's a lot more stress that I even take on knowing that if they don't succeed, I kind of take that burden a little bit.
but they've got their wife, kids, family. I mean, there's a lot more responsibility. They've got mortgage payments, car payments. That's assuming they don't even have college debt themselves. Yeah. So a lot of those people have overhead that is pretty substantial that if they don't close a deal in their first two, three months, it could be pretty bad. What I also tell people too, is that your first year, don't expect to make any money. Yeah. Assume that you have to put so much money back into yourself. There's a lot of a learning curve. And overall, I mean, you're not getting a check every two weeks. If you treat this job like a 40, a 40 hour a week job, it'll pay you 10 times over a 40 hour a week job. But I don't think a lot of people put in the effort for that. So um, I think it's just consistency. And then I would say yeah, my, my biggest struggles personally, though, were age and mindset. But I was yeah. able to overcome that pretty quickly. Yeah. And, and, I, and the reality is there is a lot of truth to a lot of people your age not feeling comfortable or knowing how to even pick up a phone and make a phone call. Because they've just never, they've never done it specifically on the business side. But they use their phone for text messaging and Absolutely. social media, not... Yeah not an actual phone. So, yeah. Quick, quick uh, follow-up kind of uh, comment uh, for you, Ryan. So in, in what you described, personally, I can relate. Now, Austin, he's he's much older than, than we are, so he can't relate to this. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but uh, but seriously, a lot, a lot of overlap in what you said in, in regards to our business. A lot of times when you start in our business, you, you start from scratch and you have no clients, you have no revenue, right? You have no sources of introductions and you're, you're just literally building a business from scratch. And when I started in this business, um, like you did, I, you started at ideal time, right? Oh seven, right yeah. before the market crashed. I started in the financial services business in 2009, mm-hmm. uh, as a 25 year old who looked like he was maybe 20. So I can relate to that, but, uh, I, I'd like, I'm, I'm curious, right? In your experience, you know, when you're starting out as a pretty young guy in the business, did you find that quickly that became a non-issue as you uh, worked, as you outworked people, your knowledge and experience grew? Uh, Did you find that eventually the conversations you were having with people, uh, essentially age became a non-factor due to your you know, perseverance and your drive to, to be successful? Oh, for sure. Um, I think that what going to the mindset thing, what I used to tell myself when I first got in was if I could have this mastered by 25, and I'm talking not doing a single deal, and that's just seven years in the business, I'm going to come out knowing more than I would say 90% of the people. I completely switched that mindset to now I need to make some money. But I think that it's a it's a big thing to have to get into an industry that young. And I think that a lot of people worry too much about the appearance thing. That was one thing I'm kind of looking back on a little bit myself and like, oh, yeah, I mean, I played the social media thing, but people overthink that. I think a lot of the people's struggles are in their head. As I started going on appointments, I kind of made it a game with my partner. I'd be like, hey, let's ask people, how old do they, how old do they think I am? The average age I got was about 25 to 26. And I had a baby face at 18. I still have a baby face. So people would be like, how, I'd be like, how old do you think I am? I don't know, 25, 26. There was a couple times I'd show up wearing like a fake ring and stuff. Just like we'd play, play games around with it. And you'd start to realize that a lot of people don't really care about that stuff if you know what you're talking about. So as I uh, as I got more confident and started doing deals, I mean, we probably, my partner and I, when we had the 16 agents, we were probably doing 30, 40 deals between him and I, not counting the team, a year. So, I mean, you do enough of that repetition-wise. You start to pick up on the lingo. You start to understand how the process works. He showed me, like I said, the ropes of from start to finish, getting people qualified to conversations with other agents, to what the paperwork looked like, to the escrow process, to closing, to getting closing gifts, like the whole nine yards of everything. So you do things enough, I mean, you're going to get comfortable doing it. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. So earlier, you you mentioned um, that you you had built up a a team, I think you had 16 people, you know, underneath you at at one time. So this question is to, to, to both of you guys for uh, the listeners out there and, and myself, I just want to have a better understanding of of the structure of your current businesses. We understand that you are a real estate agent, correct? And you've got other agents that work on your team. And, and Steve, you're a broker. So help us understand that relationship, you know, between you and how it kind of works so that we can just have a, you know, a little bit of context there. And tell us, tell us about your teams as well, please. Yeah. So Stunning Homes Realty is Steve's brokerage. I own the Zolan Group, which is my team. And our brokerage resides over at, or our team resides at his brokerage. 
So um, I've got, he has an independent contractor agreement that every agent signs. And then we do like an addendum to that agreement where the people say that they're going to be working underneath me. One of the biggest different, uh, differentiating factors with me and Steve was when I mentioned that I had the brokers that didn't really want to partner with me and didn't really want to invest in my future. That's the one thing that Steve did right off the bat that I didn't even have to ask for was, I don't care about your agents. I care about you. My relationship is with you, not with your agents. And while that was so like blunt and just upfront, I was like, well, that's what I want. I want you to have the relationship with me, the agents that I work with. I don't want that to be hovered over. I don't want them to be questioned. I want them to be kind of under my wing. And Steve gave me that freedom and flexibility right from the start. So my team has, I think, seven or eight agents on my traditional side. And then we've got nine on my wholesale operation. But my wholesale operation is completely separate from the brokerage. So can, can just quickly before we move over to Steve, can you explain what that means, uh, whole, your wholesale operation? Yep. So we've got my traditional side, which is the Zolin group. And that's where I've got all the the agents, the seven, six, seven of them, whatever, that all help with helping families buy and sell. And we also do a little bit of commercial on the side. And then my wholesale operation is that 34 Holdings LLC. And that's just my business. So then that's a completely different structure other than stunning homes. They're not connected. But Steve's actually one of my top, if not my top resource for all my information and guidance with all that. So he does like his max cash offers company. That's equivalent to me having my 34 holdings. Yeah. So So wholesale is basically you're buying houses at below market value and then you're assigning the rights to the contract. Um, It's it's an arbitrage business just like any other arbitrage business. You know, you can buy a cell phone, a used iPhone for like 200 and sell it for 250. And then you're basically making the $50, right? So you're flipping... Contracts is what wholesaling is. Uh, as far as the brokerage, you know, we have 120 agents. Uh, Ryan is one of our top performers. Uh, we have about seven different teams. And the way I've structured it is um, I'm a very big Dar- Darren Hardy fan. And one of the things he says, you know, he likes to influence the influencers. And so a lot of my business model has always been like how to lead the leaders. I don't want to have a thousand agents. That sounds like a nightmare. Okay. I want to have about 100, 150 agents, which is where we're at. But I only want to have, I only want to mentor about seven to 10 of them, and then have them run their businesses underneath, you know, have their agents and their transaction managers and so on. So uh, that's the brokerage model. And um, as small as we are, you know, there's about 45,000 agents in the Phoenix Metro uh, market. Uh, with about 120 agents, we have almost a 1% market share. Uh, so that's something that we want to do as much as we can with as little as necessary. It's kind mm-hmm. of been our business model. Yeah, so, so, sounds like a great model to me. I mean, the reality is <clears throat> running a business, if you have more than, say, 10 direct reports, it's pretty hard, yeah. you know, any business, right? It's pretty hard to truly work one-on-one with those 10 people. And like you said, in yours specifically, you're mentoring them, you're helping them gain from your experience to grow their teams, to grow their own personal business. And so I, I think you're on the right track. And and obviously just for the ease of, like you said, I mean, having a thousand agents and the oversight and everything that you have to do that, you know, that stretches yeah. well beyond. Waiting for the lawsuits to come in. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well game. beyond what you want to do, right? Headaches right. all day, every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, you know, we're talking like this is, you know, the business tycoon. So Steining Holmes Realty is one of the companies I have, you know, Ryan mentioned Max Cash Offers. That's our wholesale operation. Uh, then I also have a title company. Um, I run a podcast, which is a, uh, leads into our coaching company. Um, and then we have a, an app as well. So we do a few different things. Um, I'm a you know serial entrepreneur. I think everyone that's probably listening to this may have that problem too. <laughs> uh, and so we're always looking for ways to, to, to maximize. And uh, th- one of the reasons why we have, you know, all these different uh, vertical integration is you look at McDonald's, you know, they make five cents on a Big Mac, but they make the whole thing on the fries and the Coke. Yep. And Best Buy doesn't make a single dollar on their appliances. All yeah. of their profits is in the warranties. Yep, exactly. And so that's that's the reason why we have all these different integrations. Yeah, and and they're all tied together. They all play right in the same you know vertical, like you said. And and really, I think serial entrepreneur is just another definition for ADD, right? <laughs> so <laughs> very much so. On, on that note, let's uh, take a break to hear from our second sponsor, and then we'll we'll jump back into this conversation. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, tycoons, we're back again with these tycoons of real estate today, Ryan Zolan and Steve Trang. 
Um, before the break, we were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, just some of the struggles that you overcame and, and kind of how you got to where you are today and the structure of your business and that sort of thing. And so, you know, let's, let's start with Steve, just because 2007 is longer ago than four <laughs> years ago. So let's say, Steve, what would you change, if anything, uh, if you could go back and start over, even if it were to go another direction than real estate or, you know, whatever you want to, how, whatever direction you want to take that? Uh, the first thing I would have done is, is find a mentor. I was against that train. I was really very much opposed to paying for coaching from the beginning. I thought that you're better off learning from your mistakes, you know, paying, uh, getting the, the, the school of hard knocks. But what I've since learned is that it can really shortcut your process. Um, and I have coaches. I mean, I just hired a coach this past week uh, for YouTube. You know, I want to have a bigger presence on YouTube. So I found a guy uh, who's crushing it on YouTube, uh, Graham Stephan. And I was like, okay, well, he has a coaching program. What the hell? I signed up for that. Yeah. And so our, last, our first call was on Sunday last week. You know, so time is so valuable. And, you know, I didn't appreciate it as much back then. So uh, my life didn't change until I signed up for uh, coaching in, uh, on the real estate world in uh, around 2011. You know, was, this first time I signed for coaching. So for the first four years, I was able to tough it out. You know, I listed short sales. I listed uh, properties for Wells Fargo, Bank of America. You know, I, I figured it out. Yeah. But man, it would have been nice to have someone show me instead of having the grind all yeah. the way through. Yeah, no, I, I think coaching is so important. And, you know, coaching, mentoring, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Landon and I both have coaches as well in, in what we do. It's, it's, it's so important to have somebody else who's already been there and that can help and guide you through. So I, I appreciate that, uh, that response. What about you, Ryan? Ooh, so I'm not just saying this because he's here, but I would say that if I could have gone back and done it all over, I probably would have just started with his brokerage over at Stunning Homes. And I think I would have probably shortcutted a little bit of uh, just, I guess, the learning curve of having to get taken advantage of and kind of just do what he said, the grind as well. And it's even kind of ironic just coming from a guy at 22 years old, it's been in it for four years. But no, I think that if I could have gone back, it would have definitely to be over at Steve's brokerage sooner. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, Landon's made reference to our industry a few times, but same thing is true in our industry, right? Where there, guys will start with, you know, you said Keller Williams, one of the larger brokerages out there, Remax, Prudential, you know, the, the big ones that are out there. Um, same thing on our side, whether it's New York Life or Northwestern Mutual or Morgan Stanley or UBS, you know, any of those large shops and they'll start there. And then eventually most of them move out and go a different direction. And so it, it's, it's set up to, to learn some things, but it's not always the, the straightest path to the success that you're looking for. For sure. Right? Yeah. So I got a question for you guys. Um, you know, it, it, it's not every day that we get two guests in here where you've got some kind of a, a mentor mentee relationship. And I, I think it would be really valuable for some of our younger listeners to just have you guys talk about that for a minute, you know, because um, I remember when I first got in this business and I, I, I got good advice, you know, you got to find a, a mentor to help, you know, guide you, but it, it's a lot easier said than done to actually find somebody that is willing to invest their time, they're in a meaningful way to help you move forward in your career. It's not easy. So can you guys just kind of talk about how your relationship developed, you know, as mentor mentee and how it's been successful? Because I, I really think that people could benefit from hearing about that. I would say that for the younger listeners, especially one of the most important things is you have to bring value in yourself before you ask for value from somebody else. And while I just said a minute ago that I did want to go to Steve's brokerage sooner, I think that me getting the success that I had and being able to bring that, there was a value that kind of reciprocated itself where Steve wanted me at his brokerage because he looked at me as the guy that was 20 years old that knew what he was doing, that was a rock star already. And he saw that I've got a 20, 30 year vision of not leaving the brokerage. All I wanted was a broker that was going to basically support me and be there for me. And so when we were talking about terms of what was going to be like our, our agreement for the brokerage, part of the setup was that he was going to coach me a couple times a month. So while I just found out today, it costs a lot of money to be coached by Mr. Steve Trang. I get that a couple times a month at no cost just by being a top producer over at his brokerage. 
So it's immense value and stuff like that. But I had to bring, I think, some value to the table in order to be able to get that off the front. So for people that don't have that and just going all business in general, work for free. Discount yourself in front to be able to learn the stuff and then go from there. That's what I would, that's my input. Yeah, and, and Ryan's absolutely right. Uh, when he first approached me, um, I already knew about him from other people, right? Like I had multiple people telling me like, you know, watch out for this kid. This kid's, you know, going to be somebody. So he was, I, mean, I was already sold on him before our first meeting. Uh, as far as someone right now that's looking for a mentor, I think um, it's really simple. You just got to find someone that has what you want. If you're not the kind of person that wants, you know, a, a Lamborghini and, and a watch, and obviously, you know, who doesn't want that, right? But if that's not what you're obsessed about, like, don't chase that guy. If you want life balance, like something that's really important to me with uh, with all my time is that I'm 100% present on the weekends, right? Like family life is the most important thing to me. And I think part of it is growing up, you know, my parents worked crazy hours and they did a great job raising us, but, you know, mom and dad were never home. They were never there. And so that's something that's really important to me. So uh, people that I tend to attract are people that want to have work-life balance, uh, that want to have not an overly complicated life. And I've done that journey where I've had massive success on the outside, but not reflected on the inside, right? So I've had that journey. I've done the, the rise. I think in like my best year, I was number 38, you know, out of the 45,000 realtors in the market. You know, we were doing 100 transactions a year consistently, but that wasn't fun. And the revenue was good, but we all know profit's what matters. Revenue is just like, you know, how many likes and followers you have. Yep. Revenue, uh, profit is the impact, right? And so um, I think people that know me well have seen uh, that I've done, I've, I've done the rise, I've done the ambition thing, and now I'm all about quality of life. And so the people that tend to find me already have that mindset already. So I would say that if you're young and you're looking for a mentor, it's just find someone. They don't have to be, you know, at the age, uh, at the end of their career. Just someone that's like five, 10 years away from where you want to be. And that person can help you. They might be busy with their business and that's fine. You got to come, you know, bring value. But find someone that has the life that you want, not even just the business, the life and business combined that you want. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that there's tremendous value in what you just said. And, and you know, there's a, a phrase that I try to to live by and that I've learned over the years to be better at living by, right? And that is that no success outside of the home can compensate for failure at home, right? And I think that it's it's one of those things that any of us can can apply. I think that certain people could take that too far and say, well, you know, because work-life balance can go too far, right? Mm -hmm. It's They're not willing to put in the work to find the success that's necessary, especially early on. Your guys is industry is very similar to ours where the, the early years you have to work like a dog to get a you know a clientele built up so there's no work-life balance some, your first three years. yeah <laughs> exactly you, you've <laughs> got to work like a dog to build up that revenue early on but then if you do it the right way and you take care of your clients and you do what you're supposed to be doing then you have the ability to generate recurring revenue as time goes on and it does allow that work-life balance where you can truly like you said, be present on the weekends and, and just be with your family. So yeah, it's very cool to to see. So we're getting close to the end. So let's let's, you know, beyond the coaching and mentoring, which is certainly good advice for everybody, any any words of wisdom or advice that either of you want to to share with somebody who's thinking about getting into real estate or really even just starting to, you know, get into business for themselves in, in any industry, any advice you guys would recommend to our listeners? The biggest thing I always recommend to everybody is figure out what you want. And it's really hard when you get started. But one of the epiphanies I had at some point was that we run our business and whatever fits in our life afterwards is what we get. We're not intentional with our personal life. We're intentional with our business, which is fine. You got to, you have to be intentional with your business. Uh, but there's this, uh, there's the Parkinson principle where it's, um, you know, however much time you allot, is how much time it's going to take. If, uh, if you pay yourself first, there's always enough expenses left over or uh, money left over to, to cover your expenses. But if you pay yourself last, there's never any money there, right? And so the epiphany I had was that if I pick the life that I want, if I design the life that I want, I can build a business that supports that, right? But if I design the business that I want, there's just no time for your life. 
your life just kind of fits in where it can. And who wants to be married to a, a person that is, you know, where the marriage is priority number two. Yeah. So I think that's something that when you start, it's, it's easy to say, but I think that a lot of listeners will have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't think it's relevant at this point. Yeah, no, I think it's fair. I mean, there, there may be some listeners who don't fully grasp what you're saying until they've actually lived it, right? Yeah. And maybe maybe even it's too late and they've had that first divorce and they're headed towards the second, right? Right. And, and that kind of stuff happens and it, it's a really hard lesson to learn, but you're absolutely right. You know, it's, it's like Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind, mm -hmm. right? And so, like you said, you're designing that life you want not the business that you want. And if you if you start with the life that you want, then the business becomes part of that plan that gets you to the life that you want. Yep. Yeah. How about you, Ryan? I would just say action. I think consistency and action, the steps that you do and like you just said, the beginning is what's going to lead to the end. And then, I mean, if there's any older listeners, I would say stop pushing kids on college. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that was a plug for our listeners that heard the Josh and Zolan, or excuse me, Josh and Joel Zolan um, <laughs> deal because his brother Josh is a big believer in college being a waste of time. Yeah, for he likes the maybe. he likes the trade school. I'm all about just figuring out whatever it is you want to do and go for it. Yeah. You're all about the school of hard knocks is, is right. kind of what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> no, but I, I actually, I mean, I, so I have multiple college degrees and other designations as well. And so I, I believe in education for me personally, but it was the right fit for me, right? And Josh and I have had this conversation that you're, that the schools do push everybody towards college and that's the only way to succeed in life yep. and to earn a great living. And it's certainly not the case. And, and I'm, I'm all about education. I'm just about education and the right things. I don't see a point of paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to go get a piece of paper that's going to pay you 30 to 40 a year. Yeah, I was in marketing business and that math just didn't check out. Yep. So I think that it's all good. Some people like it and they're the people that need it in their degrees, all the power to them. Um, even if that's the route some people want to go, I just think that the whole, I'm not sure what I want to do. I'm either going to go military or I'll just go to college because I think they should take a step back and look into trade schools, look into real estate. Some people don't realize that they're really good at things that they haven't tried. And I say in your early 20s, 30s, try everything. Figure yeah. out what you don't like and whatever doesn't work cross it off. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, uh, college and universities, people don't recognize this, but that's also a business. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. And so once we look at it from that lens, you see that, okay, you know, maybe they're not what we all thought it was. Now, I'm also a big fan of education. So I have a, I was actually a PhD student at one point. So I have a master's okay. degree in electrical engineering. So I'm pro-education where it's necessary. Um, and this may piss off a lot of people, but <laughs> you don't need a liberal arts degree. You don't. Like, I don't know what you can do with it. Uh, even like, you know, I became an engineer because I was great at math. You know what you can do with a math degree? You teach can teach math. You can teach math. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, once I got out of college, like, okay, I can't do anything with this. So I'm not going to be a math major, right? So you can do something in college as long as you're pursuing a degree that you can do something with. Yeah. 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 yeah my, my daughter and I, my 17-year-old daughter and I have recently had a conversation about uh, Ivy League schools and her wanting to work with special needs children when she's done with school. And I love the fact she wants to work with special needs children when she's done with school, but it's not leading to a very high paying job. And Ivy League schools are very expensive. So let's do the math, honey, and, and, and decide if that makes that makes sense. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100%. So uh, especially as a guy that has a liberal liberal arts undergrad. So. <laughs> but I followed that up with an MBA and quite a bit of other stuff. So yeah, so Landon, bring us home. Yeah, yeah. So Ryan, an another thing that uh, we have in common. So I was a business marketing major at, a, at Cal State Long Beach. And I always tell people that my revelation came uh, halfway through my marketing program. I was so happy that I chose marketing because I knew that that was something I wanted nothing at all to do with. So um, yeah, just uh, thought I'd mention that. But um, Ryan, Steve, this has been uh, really a great interview. I love the dynamic between the two of you. I think it's been really fascinating to just understand how it works and how you guys play off of each other and help each other. Um, there probably is going to be some people out there that want to track you guys down. So can you guys just talk for a minute and uh, tell everybody how to find you guys? Yeah. Um, social media, I think would be just easiest. Um, it would be my social media handle for everything. It's just Ryan Zolan. So 
first and last name. And yeah, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, I don't really use too much, but Instagram is probably the number one. And I'm the same way. It's Instagram is at steve.trang. Uh, so there is a period between Steve and Trang. There's also my website, stevetrang.com. That's the best way to get hold of me. Fantastic. Guys, really appreciate you making the effort to come out. And I certainly enjoyed it. I know Austin did, and I'm sure our listeners got some great value. So Thanks thank you guys so much. Yeah, Thanks you're for having us. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast.